arrived. I'm going to call to order the Subcommittee on Legislative Process Reform. Ms. Schaefer, will you please take the roll? Pulowski. Present. Pulowski, present. Wolgamott. Present. Wolgamott, present. Doubt. Present. Doubt, present. Freiburg. Present. Freiburg, present. Garofalo. Present. Garofalo, present. Haley, excused. Liz Lagarde. Present. Liz Lagarde, present. Moran, excused. O'Neill. O'Neill, present. O'Neill, present. Pinto. Present. Pinto, present. Sandstead. Sandstead, present. Sandstead, present. Mr. Chair, we have a quorum. Representative Wolgamon, do you have a motion for us? Mr. Chair, I move the approval of the minutes from the Tuesday, February 16th, 2021 meeting. Representative Wolgamont moves the minutes of the previous meeting. Is there any discussion? Seeing no discussion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? Motion prevails. The minutes are approved. Uh, members, with that, I'm just going to have a brief introductory statement that, again, we're treating the subcommittee almost as if it were a conference committee where we're exchanging uh, presentations and offers back and forth. I'm hopeful that particularly next week when we'll have a couple of other pieces of legislation that will be coming before us that we'll be putting something together. So with that, Representative Sandstead has a proposal, uh, CS43. Is that the first one, Representative Sandstead, that you wish for us to take a look at? I believe we were working on CS43 at our last meeting. If you'd like to continue that conversation, otherwise I'm ready to move on to CS044. Anyone have any questions on CS43? I don't see any. So then we'll move on to CS44. Representative Sandstead. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Again, members, um, following in the same vein as our conversation, our, our hearing this past Tuesday, it is my intention to work collaboratively to actually build a bill. Um, this, the, the draft language in front of you is what I loosely call a pilot program for reopening of our restaurants. Um, CS44 was established uh, to be a pilot program to test the safety of opening up restaurants, bars, and other businesses in Greater Minnesota. It defines Greater Minnesota as excluding the seven county uh, metro region and cities of the first class that are home to our largest, most densely populated regions. In this proposal, the beginning April 1st, restaurants and bars would be exempt from executive orders that limit capacity or require uh, physical distancing, face coverings, et cetera, with the exception of employees being required to wear those. Um, it limits the hours of operation to 11 p.m. to reflect what the governor uh, just recently did about a week ago. It has a communications portion in this bill, uh, section D. It states that by May 1st, the commissioner of health must uh, report whether easing restrictions caused a statistically significant increase in new COVID cases in greater Minnesota. If the commissioner could not conclude that the easing of restriction caused a st uh, statistically significant increase, the 11 p.m. restrictions could be eased. Um, they would expire May 1st. In section E, after the effective date of this section, should the Commissioner of Health determine the Greater Minnesota Restaurant or Bar is a source of a spike, um, the establishment would be subject to the executive orders in place for the rest of the state. Um, mitigation efforts like masking and social dis dis distancing would then be required. Uh, F requires that the governor to update uh, businesses. It would require ongoing communication weekly with, um, it's my hope that the governor would do it. I think it was drafted in the first draft as being the commissioner of health, but I really would like it to be the governor or his administration um, communicating directly with the businesses on a weekly basis in terms of what comes next, what to expect, how to plan. Um, the effective date of this proposal um, would be the day following enactment, and it would expire the same day as the peacetime emergency is terminated or rescinded. 
I can say that um, since our conversation, ongoing conversation uh, in committee on Tuesday and conversations that I have been having with the Department of Health and members on both sides of the aisle, there is consensus that there needs to be some kind of metrics built into this bill. And the approach, whether it's a regional approach or a statewide approach, has some uh, pros and cons. And I think that uh, Mr. Huff is with us today. He might be able to speak to some of those a little bit later on. There is room in this definitely to expand, I think, to salons um, in terms of uh, where we're seeing you know, a greater risk of infection taking place. I think salons would be a reasonable place to expand this to. Um, again, I've had quite a bit of ongoing conversation with the Department of Health, really trying to drill down on what would a region look like? What kind of regions currently are in existence? Um, my approach has been a one size does not necessarily fit all. There are places across our state right now that are seeing very, very low numbers, no new tests, uh, no new positive test rates. And recovery for, for many of these businesses is not going to be the same either. I do believe with all of my heart, it is going to take um, businesses in greater Minnesota a much longer time to recover than it will in other parts of the state, the metro area, cities of the first class, et cetera. It is not my intent in any way, shape or form to make this uh, a Metro versus Greater Minnesota or vice versa bill. It is trying to start where numbers are lower um, and take a step out to do some expanding where we can do it reasonably. It is not in final draft, it is not in final format, um, but that is the, the gist of what I'm trying to accomplish and speak for those businesses in my uh, district specifically that are crying out for better communication, crying out for um, the opportunity to make changes where reasonable. Members, uh, questions or comments? I don't, Representative O'Neill, I think you're first. Thank you, Mr. Chair. In just listening uh, to your presentation and previously reading it, I thank you, uh, Representative Stansted, for bringing it forward. And it made me think about the casinos that have remained open um, and very little restriction. Just wondering if you've taken a look at, you had talked about infection rates or things like that related. Just wondering if you have looked at that related to casinos, because that's sort of already a pilot in places within greater Minnesota because the casinos have remained open by and large where other restaurants and bars and event centers and bowling alleys and the, and the like have all been closed down. Wondering if you've looked at that already. I have We're not. Um, oh, Mr. Chair, thank you. I'm sorry. I have not looked specifically at uh, the casinos. What I can say is that I think we can all agree without a doubt that there are inconsistencies that are hard for any of us to explain. Um, and I think having the Department of Health maybe do that would be a much better thing than me trying to guess. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I'm guessing, just guessing here, that if there were massive outbreaks in the casinos, that would have been front page news on every you know, not only in every newspaper, but across mainstream media. Um, and I haven't heard anything, but um, maybe the Department of Health has something different than that. Maybe they've had outbreaks that haven't been publicized. I don't know. But I would think that if there were massive outbreaks because of casinos, that we would have heard that. And I'm just wondering if that sort of isn't already, you know, basically a pilot within greater Minnesota to say, well, if we haven't had outbreaks there, we can translate that to other bars and restaurants in greater Minnesota and just, and frankly, honestly, in the metro and just, you know, let them open in the full capacity. Do you have any thoughts about that, Representative? Representative O'Neill, uh, Assistant Commissioner Huff is with us. Do you want him to respond to that? Maybe if he could just briefly respond, Mr. Chair, about if there actually were any outbreaks within casinos and I mean, certainly that might be the first great test project pilot that we've already done. 
And that's kind of what Representative Sandstead's bill is attempting to do, that that would give us the ability to say, hey, why don't we just open up businesses across Minnesota since we've already uh, basically tested it. Thank you. Assistant Commissioner Huff, um, I know you're with us. Uh, would you like to respond? Welcome to the committee and uh, please identify yourself for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Dan Huff. I'm an Assistant Commissioner with the Minnesota Department of Health. Um, and Representative O'Neill, thank you for your question. We have had outbreaks and we have tracked outbreaks in casinos. Um, we work with our tribal health partners um, as uh, uh, all of these are, are tribal run operations. Um, and uh, um, while I don't have the data at my fingertips, I can say that yes, we have had outbreaks and have tracked outbreaks in casinos um, during this period of time. Assistant Commissioner Huff, would it be possible since you have the data to get it to us next week that would be uh, helpful, uh, particularly to address Representative O'Neill's concern. And the level of those outbreaks would be, I think, interesting to all of us to find out what, what exactly has been going on uh, within those casinos. Mr. Chair, I will check with my team and uh, see what we can get you for next week. All right, thank you. Representative O'Neill, do you have more? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, uh, you know, again, we don't it's hard to really say if we don't know if it was an outbreak is two people or an outbreak is 100 people. It's really hard to say. And I'm assuming that when the Department of Health got involved, they were able to help mitigate it. Um, again, I, I haven't seen anything in the news or any. It doesn't seem to be like this uh, very noteworthy because I think we would have heard about it. So uh, I like this plan. I'd like it to be even more expansive uh, as Representative Baker was here before. He had a very specific plan to open up all businesses by May 1st. Um, I think we need to turn the corner. We need to open up businesses. And, you know, I was doing some research myself and looking at Wisconsin. And it's really interesting that if you look at case counts, if you look at deaths uh, pro or by 100,000 people, if you look at uh, hospitalizations and ICU usage, it's almost indistinguishable, indistinguishable between Minnesota and Wisconsin's numbers when you um, rate or when you uh, adjust it for population. And so, you know, we've had a tremendous amount of shutdown and restriction here in Minnesota, where Wisconsin had some, and then most of it was lifted, and they were left with very little. So, um, I'm just wondering how much more we're going to tamp down and crush our businesses before we finally let them open and what benefit really has it been? And uh, I question that. I question how much benefit have we actually received from crushing our businesses? And I'd like to see them open sooner than later. And at least this isn't a step, a step in the direction of opening them in greater Minnesota. Um, and I'm thinking that, you know, if you did actually see an outbreak, we could probably deal with that. All right. Thank you. Representative Freiberg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and thank you once again, Representative Sandstead, uh, for bringing these uh, proposals forward. I really appreciate your hard work on behalf of your constituents and know how much you are concerned for uh, the economic well-being of the area you represent. Um, I appreciate that you also that you mentioned uh, that you recognize the need to look at metrics. Um, I mean, if we make any changes to the governor's authority, I think that'll be an important part of any policy. And I know we're, we'll be talking a little bit about that later, I believe, as well. I'm glad you're, you know, I, I appreciate that you said you're not interested in kind of making this a Metro versus Greater Minnesota issue. I'm certainly not either. I know this has been a difficult time for businesses in the Metro area as well as in Greater Minnesota. And I'm glad you mentioned this isn't the final version of the legislation. I mean, the way the bill is, the way the proposal is set up, it does ease the restrictions for businesses outside of the seven county Metro area, but not in the Metro area. And I, I just, I, I'm wondering how that matches up to the case prevalence. Um, I'm, I'm not sure it totally does. Um, I know when we had a hearing on Tuesday and I thought this was gonna come up, I just looked up case prevalence by county in Minnesota. Um, I, I couldn't find the document just now, um, but I know, I'm know i glad Commissioner Huff is here because I know he's very familiar with the data. My recollection was that COVID prevalence is actually higher in some parts of greater Minnesota at the moment. Um, it seemed like it was higher, particularly in Western Minnesota. I guess I'm just wondering, um, you know, since this does kind of treat different areas of the state differently. I'm, I'm just wondering if Commissioner Huff could talk to, you know, 
how the COVID case rate breakdown is is working in Minnesota. Assistant, Assistant Commissioner Huff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And actually, it might be helpful for me to turn to a couple of slides, if that's okay. I think um, Mr. Worth has got you queued up. Um, so. Great. Could you turn to slide 12, please? Um, and uh, I believe the question was Representative Freiburg. Is that correct? It was Representative Freiburg. That's correct. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, Representative Freiburg and Mr. Chair, um, what this shows is, so we, just for illustrative purposes, we divided the, or we showed what case rates are for some different uh, regions in the state. We chose two regional, uh, I guess, configurations that have already been created. This is the the regional healthcare coalitions. Um, and so you can see that the highest case rate right now, which actually doubled in a week, is Northwest um, part of the state, um, and then South Central um, part of the state. Uh, and then if we go to the next slide, please. This is the economic development regions. This is just another you know, regional framework the state uses. This actually divides the state into even more regions. So you can see here again, um, the Northwest um, is the highest right now. Um, that area is actually at 31.1 cases per 100,000. Um, and uh, um, if we, I think you were referencing the Metro, so the Twin Cities is at 14.1. So that would be more than double. So what we find is, yes, um, case counts tend to change over time. We have found that probably the highest case rates per 100,000 have been traditionally in the western part of the state and then the southern part of the state. Um, and uh, so southwest Minnesota has often has often been quite high. Um, and right now we're having some some significant spread in the northwest part of the state. Uh, does that answer your question, sir? Representative Freiberg. Yes, that's very helpful. I, I didn't know you'd have an actual graph queued up that directly answered my question, so I appreciate it. Thank you. Representative said, we've asked uh, Assistant uh, Commissioner Huff to uh, prepare some unique slides based on what we've been covering over the last uh, few weeks. So some of the slides are are either new or we haven't seen them before. So that's why he's here today and uh, he'll stay with us uh, to answer specific questions if he's got it. And if he doesn't, hopefully we'll have it by next week. Mr. Representative Freiberg, I'm sorry, Representative Sandstead. I just actually wanted to um, comment on Representative, or thank Representative Freiberg for his comments. And then um, also share, since the time that we had met on Tuesday and talked, um, Late last night, actually, I ended up getting some of the information I had requested from the Department of Health. I had hoped to be able to have um, an improved draft to put before you today, uh, just with not enough time um, given the new information. Uh, I haven't been able to do that, but I do, I would very much like to hear what uh, Mr. Huff has to say today, or maybe he can walk us through that. The other question I would like to pose to Mr. Huff um, and for other members to consider as I have continued to think about the conversations we've had, the need to, I think everybody understands the need to and the desire to open, but um, also have the ability to fall back if things go the wrong direction. Um, it seems like there had been some consensus around that in Clearly, we are all seeing how complex this is. I think once we get into the conversation about different regions, people will understand there just isn't a, a one size fits all, even in the pilot program that fits greater Minnesota versus Metro or whatever. There isn't, that isn't perfect. And so I've thought, what about just using the model that school districts use currently because it's predictable? It's uh, familiar, um, allowing businesses within a school district to open up if their students are, uh, and, and you have three different levels, and certainly that is based on metrics too. 
with either in-person learning hybrid um, or uh, distance learning. And perhaps there's something we could do. So once we see your presentation today, if there's a way of kind of relating that back to the plan that the schools are using to see how they you know, intersect or overlap if they do at all. And maybe there's a, a sweet spot in the middle that we can find. Assistant Commissioner Huff, do you have something that uh, would respond to Representative Sandstead's in inquiry? Uh, Mr. Chair, I do, if I can find it, I do have a slide that can compare sort of our metrics um, between, say, case rate per 100,000, the way the, um, the measure is for the schools, and then the, uh, actually compared to the CDC, we did this for the, for the schools update. But I also can share just some uh, kind of a presentation um, uh, well, it, it, the slides I have today, and, and I'll let you choose which one you'd like to see, because there have been discussion on what other states um, have as far as their plans. We did pull up just some research of some other states to show what they use for their plans. Then also, I just have a, a little more um, deeper dive into how Minnesota has done it and uh, some pros and cons for a regional approach versus the statewide approach. So I'm happy to go through any or all of those slides that are helpful, sir. Assistant Commissioner Huff, why don't you proceed? Thank you. Um, if Well, I guess if we could just start with slide one then, that would be great. Um, so you'll see here, what we did is we just took a sampling of, of the states that we could find that do have a plan um, of you know how when do you do dial backs and when do you do dial forwards as far as mitigation strategies around businesses and other other type gatherings? Um, many of these, as you will see, they focus on uh, positivity rate. They focus on uh, cases, but then some of them also focus on hospitalizations and deaths. We look at hospitalizations and death rate. However, we consider hospitalizations a lagging indicator. That is, by the time cases have gone up, um, it's cases come first and then hospitalizations come after that because people have to get really sick and then go to the hospital. And what we, we look at is how do we get ahead of that? Because once our hospitals are full, it can take a while to bring things back down. We consider it a lagging indicator. Um, but uh, instead of going through, and unless there's a particular state uh, someone would like me to, to hone in on, we did some slides in some of these particular states. Why don't we um, just switch on to slide number seven? And I'll talk about what we have done in Minnesota. Thank you. So the, the stay safe approach in Minnesota is this Venn diagram that, that I mentioned earlier, and you've probably heard the governor talk about it. And instead of just relying upon one set measure of metrics, which adds predictability, and that's definitely a pro uh, for doing a you know definite, if you hit this level, then, then this happens. One of the things that's a con for that level is it doesn't allow to take into a, um, um, uh, taken to the decision making other factors. So, for example, um, what is unemployment uh, insurance at right now? Is the federal stimulus giving additional support for businesses? Is there a state support for businesses? If not, then that means businesses and employment is at much higher risk. And so there's that balance. What's the well being of people? How are people um, uh, being affected by this? And it's a balance of, of risks. We have the COVID risk, we have the economic risk, and the risk to the just the well-being of, of all of Minnesotans. That's a balance. Um, and it's it's perhaps instead of playing, you know, a strict pattern um, where if this happens, you must do this, it allows for more flexibility to take into more of these, these things into account. Uh, next slide, please. However, we have been tracking since May, publishing uh, since May of last year on the state's dashboard, um, these public health risk measures. 
And there are actually uh, five measures, but I'm gonna focus on the three that we look at probably the most. And that's the positivity rate, the case growth, and our testing capacity or testing volume. Testing is what makes the others valid. Uh, you have to have a certain amount of tests that you're doing for the others to just make statistical sense. Um, and uh, uh, positivity, as you know, is really coming down. We're at 3.7% positivity, which is phenomenal. Um, we also see that our case rate is dropping. Um, in this slide, it's 14 and a half, and it's actually in our most recent um, uh, it is actually down to 14.3. So it's dropped since then, which is exciting. Um, so it continues to drop statewide. Our testing capacity, or rather our testing volume, is a little concerning. I think as people have focused more on the vaccine and are less concerned, their desire to get tested is less. But we do need to keep testing up statewide. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. The reason we focus so much on cases is you got to have sick people to have people who are in the hospital um, or people who die. And it's a direct proportionality because we know the percentage of people on average who end up in the hospital or unfortunately pass away from COVID. And what that allows us to do is to say from a risk perspective, what are we comfortable with? We're currently at, it's actually a little lower than 15. Um, so we're at just over 14 right now. And at just over 14, we have about 800 cases on average a day or about 5,600 cases a week. And that means that, you know, we're gonna have about 260 people enter the hospital every week, about 40 end up in ICU, and unfortunately about 70 deaths per week. That's on average and what we have found statistically um, throughout the pandemic. As we reduce the level of cases, we reduce those negative impacts. So for example, if we were to get down to only five cases per 100,000, and that is the risk score, if we're below that, we're, we consider ourselves in the, the green zone um, on our public risk scores, that means we would be below 30 deaths per week. 30 deaths per week of one disease is still very, very significant. However, all of this is a balance and all of this is about what risks do we uh, as Minnesotans and as you as policymakers, what risk are you willing to tolerate um, um, balancing, you know, um, economic hardship, uh, well-being hardship against death or hospitalization. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the other thing is that we, uh, um, um, uh, Representative Sanstead asked us to look at a regional approach, and there are definitely pro pros and cons uh, for a regional versus a statewide approach. Now, these are just some of the ones that, that I've identified. You, no doubt, will probably identify more pros or maybe more cons. Um, but a regional approach, it more finely tunes our mitigation to local conditions so that we don't have someone feeling like, you know, it's fine in my community. Why do I have to suffer? Because another community has high case rate. Um, it can provide more uh, community ownership and accountability. Uh, you know, when we're a big state, maybe it feels less that we have less control. In a more regional approach, maybe we feel more control over the disease and then the impact of mitigation. Um, it can also target mitigation in a region before it spreads to other regions. So for example, Northwest Minnesota, you saw doubled its case rate just in the last week. So a regional approach could allow us to target, oh, we need to dial back there before that leaks out and spreads to the rest of the state. Um, and I think also there's, you know, that there has been a, a myth through this um, that it is a, an urban issue a metro issue. And I think what we see in the data is that it's really not um, because it's different throughout the state. And actually we have regions that have been significantly higher than the metro pretty much since last summer. Next slide, please. 
Um, there are cons as well. Um, you know, people, as well as infectious disease, don't just stay within a border. People move about. Um, diseases, they spread as people move. Um, you know, one concern, if you have one area that, say, all the bars and restaurants are open in this area, does everyone flock there and bring their disease with them? That could be a risk. Um, it adds complexity and challenges in communication, um, enforcement, administration. You know, we think of counties and we think of the state, but we don't necessarily think of which healthcare region am I, am I in or which economic development region am I in? So that it, it would make messaging more confusing um, and just administering that enforcement, et cetera. Um, and uh, whenever we have a border, uh, you know, we hear this say Fargo and Moorhead, people in Moorhead, um, businesses suffer because people just go over to Fargo if, if they're more lenient there. Well, um, if you increase borders, then that just increases. So uh, you'll have many more lines drawn and wherever you draw a line, there's somebody on this side of it and there's somebody right across the street could be literally is uh, impacted differently. Um, so that just made, you know, a sense of fairness there. One of the challenges, and this is the real challenge when we look at the county level, is when you have a lower population, statistically, um, our measures begin to break down just because, so like Hennepin County, you know, 1.1 million people versus Cook County at 6,000 people. That's a really big difference when you're looking at a, at, um, a population-based metric, which all of our metrics are. Um, and that can give you great volatility in the numbers. You know, you can have a hundred people ill in Hennepin County and it doesn't move the dial, but if you have one person ill in Cook County, it would move the dial quite a bit. Um, the reason, and, and Representative Sam said, you mentioned the, um, school district numbers. We tried to balance that a little bit with the school district. So that's based upon those County measures by making it a longer period of time. It's a 14 day period of time. There again, though, there is quite a bit of volatility in those numbers um, for those smaller counties. It was the balance between on schools, we wanted to really make it much more about local decision making. Um, there, the county number is a, it's always been a starting point on the conversation. And that's where the regional support team advises the local school district um, and it's, it's never been a conscriptive thing. Um, so the, the, those are just some pros and cons of, of a regional versus statewide approach. And then the next slides, I think I already showed, which just shows here's two ways that we, uh, have looked at dividing the state. Um, and you can see that there is definite variability, um, in regions around the state. So if you were to use a regional metric, you could actually you know, have some parts of the state would be under greater restriction than other parts of the state. Um, and so there's pros and cons come into effect. And then the next slide is just the economic development regions breakdown as well. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Doe. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a question for <clears throat> Excuse me for Mr. Huff. If uh, you know, we are um, approaching, I was on a call with the governor this morning. Uh, I've been saying we're at 100% uh, vaccination in nursing homes. Um, what we have learned, and I, my point was, I, I don't think we're exactly at 100%, but I think we're really close, which is awesome. Um, and I think that was really a, a great achievement to get those most vulnerable people vulnerable people vaccinated as quickly as possible. Um, but that impacts our numbers in a different way. So we can still have, as we vaccinate people, um, we can, uh, very obviously, this is, I would assume just common sense, but you're the, you're the data guy. So I'm just asking you, what is the data going to show us? As we vaccinate the most vulnerable, um, we're changing the ratio between the number of people who will get, uh, um, infected, whatever the right term is, and the number of people who will be hospitalized or who will be, we, I think we do know, and we have learned from COVID that if you were in a nursing home, uh, COVID is 
two or 3,000 times more severe for you than if you were in an elementary school. Um, so I, I think that as we work through this vaccination and as we vaccinate more people, um, and, and specifically the most vulnerable people, and we see the numbers just crashing, right? Um, our hospitalizations have crashed. Our, I mean, we're just super low. I think, I think even more than people were anticipating. Um, so what impact... You know, I, I feel like one of the criticisms might have been through this whole thing that we treated every population the same. We treated the elementary school and the nursing home the same. Um, and, and maybe at the time we could make a case for that, but I don't think we can anymore. So how, how are we going to see these numbers interact um, when we see us uh, vaccinating the most vulnerable in our population? Assistant Commissioner Huff. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Leader Doubt, it's an excellent question. And as we vaccinate, we will definitely see. So that table that I showed that says, you know, if you have this many cases, then we would predict you have this many deaths, this many hospitalizations. That table will change. And it is changing based upon vaccination. So vaccination is, um, and as you said, you know, we've done pretty much, we're, we're, we're complete with that sort of 1A, uh, distribution in long-term care. There are some caveats there. It's been offered to everyone. It doesn't mean everyone takes the vaccine. Also, the uh, population changes. So um, we have people entering and leaving long-term care all the time. Um, so that population changes. So th there, are, there are some caveats, but you're exactly right that as we increase vaccination of our more vulnerable folks, then we would see the death rate go down and the hospitalization rate go down because it, uh, COVID is something that disproportionately impacts um, older folks and then people with pre-existing conditions. One of the things I think is the challenge um, and, and that I would, I would um, maybe differ on in, in the statement of you know, treating elementary schools different from long-term care we treat them differently in what the appropriate mitigation strategies are. But part of how we and why we've taken a broad-based approach is that no population is a bubble in Minnesota. Um, we know that if college students go out to bars and begin to spread COVID, they will spread it to other people. Um, we also know that even young people, you know, we have had. Uh, over 800 teenagers who've been in the hospital because of COVID. So it's even though it's a much lower number, it still does impact people with pretty severe disease. Um, so I would say vaccine is definitely changing the picture, and that will continue to change the picture. One thing that we worry about, too, is how will variants change the picture? It's one of the reasons that this uh, uh, kind of that flexible approach has been so important um, as variants increase, that may change that table because it could mean a couple of things. One, vaccination is not as successful or effective, or um, you know, it can be more virulent or cause more severe disease. That's a big unknown. The vaccination rate is more of a known. And we can definitely begin to look at, yep, as we vaccinate more and more people, and we say if 90% of long-term care people are vaccinated, we know that whatever the percentage of deaths were from folks in long-term care, we can you know, balance out that table that you saw. Representative Dell. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, just, you know, and I, I appreciate that. I think my point was, I think at some point, um, the, the, the validity of using the infection rate um, diminishes um, as we uh, as we vaccinate more of the vulnerable population and and you know I'm interested in, in watching those numbers very closely and I think you know we all probably should uh, those of us at least who hope to have a voice in uh, the public policy uh, that will be keeping Minnesota safe as we come out of the pandemic um, so this bill you know I want to bring it back to this particular bill and I appreciate the information that you've given um, I assume you're here as as also the voice of the administration does the administration uh, support or endorse this concept or support or endorse this bill or are they opposed to it 
Assistant Commissioner Huff. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, Leader Doubt. You know, I, I think the, the administration is very interested in working with the legislature in creating a framework. Um, the, uh, you know, I think in the governor's letters, he's expressed that. Um, I, uh, um, I think that the discussion that, that this committee has been engaged in has been, I think, very helpful. Um, you know, and, and I think it's important just to, to think of um, as, as you explore this bill um, or these bills, um, I think my role is to just show here are some of the pros and cons that we see some of the risk factors that, that you would uh, um, you know, want to be aware of as you balance these. Um, I see it more in my role is to provide that technical assistance for you. Um, I will say that um, because the disease changes rapidly and has continued to change rapidly, there is an important role for some flexibility um, that, I mean, and quite frankly, to have an executive be able to make executive decisions um, in response to, to new information. Um, so I would say, uh, um, hopefully I've answered your question there um, the best I can. Representative Dowd. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Sansley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Commissioner Huff, when we have been in conversation about metrics, the three metrics that you really encouraged me to consider, if I'm correct, were case positivity, case growth, and then our testing. Is that correct? Assistant okay. Commissioner Doug. Assistant Commissioner <laughs> Huff, I'm sorry. Um, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative, yes. Those were the three that I suggested a focus on. Would it be possible? Mr. Chair, my apologies. Would it be possible to pull up the slideshow again that we just took a look at and take a look at slide number one? And I think uh, Mr. Worth is going to do that. Thank you. Representative Sandstein. Thank you, Mr. Chair. If I am correct, uh, and there's possibly others, but it looks like North Dakota is looking at the same metrics. Is that accurate, Mr. Huff? Assistant Commissioner Huff. Um, Mr. Chair and uh, Representative Sand said yes. Now there is one caveat here and it's just because I haven't deeply dived into it. Um, different states may count things, even though we're counting the same thing, they may count it differently. So ours is, New cases per day over a seven day rolling average per 100,000 people. Some people look at it like all the cases over a week or all the cases over a 14 day period, cases per 100,000 people, cases per 10,000 people. So there's some variability there, but the, the measure's the same. They may just be counting at bushels or pecks. Representative Sanchez. Mr. Chair, uh, Com Assistant Commissioner Huff, do you have any idea what North Dakota's plan currently looks like in comparison to Minnesota's as far as openness? Um, I, I just did a brief search. I saw some kind of color-coded uh, metrics, which I think we have. We have a, if I'm correct, in our other slides, we saw a red, a yellow, and a green. Um, with, and, and I have received those breakdowns for you. But do you have any ability to speak to what they're doing versus what we're doing? Assistant Commissioner Huff. Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Sanstead, I don't have that with me right now, and I would hate to misquote it, but I can definitely dive into that and, and get back to you. Representative Sanstead. Thank you very much. I would very much appreciate that information. Just as a comparison, it looks like um, something reasonable to start looking at. And then I have one more question for you. I am wondering, as these vaccinations um, continue to roll out and uh, there is a reasonableness to move forward and do something in terms of our businesses, whether it's the restaurant industry or gyms or salons, uh, again, there seems to have been some consensus also around around mitigation efforts in social distancing and talking about mask wearing. What is your thought um, for people who are vaccinated or who have had the, the disease and are carrying the antibodies 
in terms of masking? Is there something that they can do to identify themselves as having received the vaccine? So if they chose to go into a place of business and not wear a mask, is that an option? And is it a way for them to signal I'm safe, you know, I'm not just ignoring you as a human being, I'm taking you into consideration. Assistant Commissioner Huff. Um, Mr. Chair, Representative Sanstead, I'm really glad you asked that question because there's that's a question we get a lot. Um, so first of all, I'll just say that masking is probably the number one most effective and yet low impact strategy we can employ. Um, masks are effective, they're safe, and they really do help slow the spread and prevent the spread of the disease. Um, one of the challenges for us is because this is still a new disease, you know, we've had it, we've, the world has a scientific community has been aware of this disease for 14 months now, which in scientific terms is actually pretty, pretty short amount of time. Um, that means that the longest person that had been infected that we can study is only 14 months of immunity. Um, we just do not know how long immunity, that's natural immunity, that is, you know, I've been infected and recovered versus the vaccinated immunity, how long does that last? Um, what the CDC says is um, it looks like three months. If I'm infected in January, I have through March where I would consider myself immune. And that begins to drop after that up until six months. It seems I still have some immunity, but it's uncertain how much I have after that. Then if we look at vaccines, vaccines, the study that was done in vaccines, all the studies last, last year as a part of Operation Warp Speed, all those clinical trials looked at um, the impact of the vaccine in reducing disease. So... Um, we think of, I'm infected, the virus is in me. Um, am I infectious? I'm spewing out the virus when I talk or cough or laugh, or I have disease. The di how, is that di how is that virus impacting my body in a negative way? You know, do I have a fever? Um, do I have COVID fog? Am I in the hospital fighting for my life because I can't breathe? That's the disease part of it. The vaccine is 95% effective at preventing disease. What we don't know yet is does it prevent infection and does it prevent me from becoming infectious? So we, we just, science can't answer that question yet. We know that a lot of vaccines will reduce, will even stop you from getting infected. But we know other disease, other vaccines just stop the disease, even if you do get infected. We just don't know what the COVID vaccines are doing yet. So there's no way for science to say that someone is safe after vaccination. Um, what we do know is someone is uh, protected from the disease for three months, but we don't know much after that if they actually had the infection. So I would say from a kind of like that passport idea of I don't need to wear a mask because I've had it, the science would say we don't have good supporting evidence to support that strategy. What we do know is we have lots of evidence that say masking is really, really helpful. And therefore, we would say it's a pretty low impact mitigation strategy, keep masking. And that's what the recommendation of the CDC is. Representative Sandstead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Pinto. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I wonder if we can get that slide back up showing the other states. Um, and my apologies if I missed. Um, yeah, thank you, Mr. Worth. Um, and and I may have missed this and just spaced in my apologies, but I just wonder if Mr. Ruff, uh, Commissioner Ruff could um, just talk a bit about kind of the ways in which the different states are using these numbers. Because there's the there's some differences in the in the numbers, I assume, but then also like what does it mean to use a metrics-based approach? Assistant Commissioner Huff. Mr. Chair, um, uh, Representative Pinto. So what we know is that states use these in different ways. Some states are really strict about them, especially those that have a regional approach, that if you hit this benchmark, you move back a phase or a dial or a color code, and you get more mitigation standards. Um, 
And then some states are a little more squishy with them. Um, they're a little bit more of a guidance. And then we know that some states had them, and then all of a sudden they disappeared from their website because I think they figured all well, those didn't work and we'll just quietly let them go away. Um, so uh, again, for each of these states, we can dive more in and provide that kind of information as to you know how they used it and when they used it. But it really is a um, you know it's a it's a baker's dozen as far as some have done it some ways and others have done it other ways. Representative Pinto. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I think I'm probably done with this slide, um, but thank you, Mr. Worth. Um, and then, uh, uh, Assistant Commissioner, you could also then just comment on, I guess I'm, I've been naively, I think, thinking that we could, um, or perhaps naively, I guess we'll find out, thinking, uh, you know, we could uh, identify these three metrics and the levels and then identify levels of restriction that might link to the, to the levels of metrics. You, you go above a certain case rate, uh, this thing happens, that thing happens. Um, I know we'll be hearing, I believe we'll be maybe hearing a proposal um, Representative Baker that, that ties into that a bit in terms of lifting restrictions. Um, but then building on the comments from Leader Doubt, on the one hand, that maybe there's some shifting in the numbers on the one hand. On the other hand, one can imagine variants um, uh, that mean that uh, the virus is more infectious or more deadly, et cetera. Can you just talk about sort of how we can take into account, even if we come up with this framework, how to take into account shifting circumstances where on the one hand, maybe the situation is less deadly because of more vaccinations, whatever else. Maybe on the other hand, the situation is more deadly or more infectious because of a changing virus. Assistant Commissioner Huff. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Pinto, I think you sort of hit, a, hit upon the epidemiologist dilemma of um, how do we create a framework based upon where we are today that's going to take into account and still be valid a month from now when our assumptions have changed. Um, vaccination is changing what where we are today and the variants change. And if it was just vaccination, it would be easy because we have a lot more data on that. Um, and we could we we have enough information to, to predict how vaccines are going to impact uh, the disease and the severity of hospitalizations and that kind of thing. Um, we we have no data on the variants. We have very little information to know how they're going to impact things. Um, so as far as the framework, um, providing some flexibility in the framework to account for changes, I think that's what's important. As um, you know, we could actually map out what we would anticipate is going to happen with vaccination. Um, what we cannot map out is what might happen with variants. Um, one of the things that we also don't know is um, what the uptake of the vaccine is going to be. You know, we've we've heard the term of eighty percent um, vaccinated um, to to really make a difference. Well, we we know that. You know, there's vaccine hesitancy. Many people are fearful of the vaccine. Um, and that's unfortunate, but it's a reality. And so one of the things that we don't know is, are we going to get to a point where, you know, right now we have a scarcity of vaccine. Do we have where just people, are, you know, there's a significant number of people who just don't want it. Representative Pinto. Representative Pinto, I think you're muted. Mr. Chair, I certainly am. Um, my apologies um, to you and to members. Um, uh, and uh, Assistant Commissioner, thank you for um, for those uh, uh, for those words. Um, I guess as you were talking, it was making me think that. So, Representative Sandstead, I really appreciate um, this because um, I feel like this proposal then that's in front of us kind of comes at things from the opposite direction of what I've been thinking, but in a really helpful way. In that, one option is we lay out these detailed if this then that. And I feel like what your proposal is coming at it is to say, let's look at each stage about, you know, if this, what actually happened. Um, uh, I guess it would be important to me uh, in your proposal moving forward that not just not just be a one-time thing. You've kind of got the April 1st and May 1st um, dates, but recognize that uh, as circumstances continue to change, we'd have to continue looking at that. And I guess I especially would want to understand um, and maybe some, maybe this is a question for the assistant commissioner. I think about it sort of how 
uh, the department might make the assessment contained in your bill, Representative Sandstead, and how they might assess uh, the degree to which a given restriction has led to, uh, or lack thereof, has led to an increase in cases. Um, maybe I'll just ask Mr. Chair if that's okay to ask Assistant Commissioner Hub just to comment on that point, how that might work if this bill were to be in force, how the commissioner would make that kind of assessment. Assistant Commissioner Huff, do you think you can answer that one today? Mr. Chair, I would prefer to come back to answer that question. I think we need I need to think about that and consult with some folks because it is really a tricky question. Um, I think um, for me, what's uh, the question I would ask is if we look at that, you know, that table that I showed you, if you have this many cases, you have this many deaths, um, what are you as an elected body comfortable with? Um, as far as, you know, we are comfortable with this many deaths or we're comfortable with this much hospitalization. And then we can help project how that might change over the course of vaccination, for example. But it, it sort of comes back to, and that's the, that's the, you know, the call, the elected leader call, which is what is acceptable. Representative Pinto. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And this is to make sure thank you for bringing us back to that, um, because uh, it's uh, helpful to be thinking that we've got these data points, et cetera, and then ultimately it's uh, it's uh, the judgment of policymakers. Um, and as you say, to be thinking about, we're balancing some really difficult things out. Um, I, Representative Sands said, thank you so much, because I, I view this and the other proposal as really being, and again, I've got, I have thoughts about where things should go, and I want to continue talking with you, but, um, but you're clearly bringing a really dedicated and thoughtful approach um, to this and on behalf of your constituents. So thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Representative Sandstead. I just uh, would like to say thank you. That's really all I have. I think with some of the information that has just come in, um, it's time to take some of this data and look at it and see if we can uh, come up with something. If people have ideas today that they'd like to share, that's something I'm certainly open to. If um, this is something that, Mr. Chair, you would prefer to take offline and people can talk um, privately, that's fine with me too. Um, I definitely think that people understand the heart of what we need to do. We need to recognize that things are in a changing time right now. Um, there seems to be some reasonableness to examine, uh, loosening some of the restrictions where that has to be drilled down, what things have to be in place, uh, metrics for measurement. As I said earlier, if we open and there is an issue, we have to be able to address that going the opposite direction as well. Um, and then we do have to talk about mitigation uh, where it's appropriate. And, and again, with some of this information that we're just seeing for the first time, it might be wise to ponder it a little bit and see if something makes sense you know, as we digest this. All right, members, I have nothing else on the agenda for today. It's been a long week. I know many of you are going to be working on numbers of proposals over this week that you're going to bring forward next week. Uh, we will also have some bill introductions coming to us on Monday, as I understand it. And Representative Lizagard, Representative Sandstead, and I've had a couple other representatives approach me about uh, particular bills. So if there's nothing else uh, that the member wishes to bring up at this time, I'm going to say that the meeting is adjourned. But I won't bang the gavel until I give you some time. All right, meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone.